More than 38,000 meals dropped from Gaza's skies in the first US airdrops. Australia's spy boss reveals details to SBS about the unnamed politician at the centre of a spying case. Is it time to put more attention on addressing the declining global fertility rate? The first report in our special series. And Brazil has a go at mediating a century-long territorial dispute in the region. I'm Janice Peterson. This is SBS World News. Good evening. After almost five months of fighting, a new deal between Israel and Hamas could be days away. US officials say Israel has agreed to a proposal that would see a six-week pause in the fight in exchange for more hostages. But disagreements remain over the precise terms. Neither Israel nor Hamas have officially commented on the reports. In Gaza, the US has conducted its first aid airdrops. We'll have more on this shortly. But pressure is building in Israel and abroad to secure a ceasefire deal that would lead to the release of more hostages. They filled a four-lane highway, led by the families of the hostages. They've travelled four days and more than 100 kilometres with this message. Come this evening to Jerusalem, our capital city, to be with us and to yell as loud as we can, bring them home now. The crowd growing larger and louder as it crept closer to Jerusalem. By the evening, up to 20,000 had reached Paris Square, just outside the Prime Minister's residence. I'm turning to you, President Biden, to continue to press all sides and not relent until an agreement is signed to bring our loved ones home. Another round of negotiations on a new deal will begin tonight in Cairo. The US is hopeful it will be the last. Biden administration officials telling US media Israel has now more or less accepted a proposal for a six-week ceasefire. That time would be used to ramp up aid deliveries and to, quote, build something more enduring. In exchange, Hamas would release the most vulnerable of the roughly 130 hostages it's still holding, although the officials said Hamas has not yet agreed to a defined category of vulnerable hostages. And that is proving to be a sticking point. We hope that we will be able to achieve a uh, you know, ceasefire before Ramadan. We hope that we will be able to achieve ceasefire today. Because not achieving a ceasefire today, it means that another 1,000 Palestinians will be either killed or injured. But Israeli officials are saying they won't commit a delegation to Cairo until Hamas provides a list of hostages who are still alive. A Hamas spokesperson says more than 70 have now been killed in Israeli attacks. Aid groups pleading with both sides not to delay. I have in my many years as a humanitarian worker never seen a population so bombarded over such a long time in such a crowded area with no escape. So this situation is screaming for a ceasefire. And that was the message at rallies around the globe. Mediators meeting in Cairo with the world watching. Claudia Farhart, SBS World News. And US military planes have now joined Jordanian and Egyptian counterparts in airdropping meals into Gaza. But aid organisations say a ceasefire is needed to allow food to be distributed safely. Precious cargo on American planes. 38,000 meals dropped along the coastline to a hungry people. After the rush for food, <laughs> disbelief sets in. <laughs> this is what they're dropping, this man says. Is this enough for 10,000 people? In Gaza City, men and boys clamber for bags of flour, hoping to feed their families. The situation in Gaza tonight can only be described as catastrophic. Uh, the humanitarian needs are absolutely through the roof. Uh, families are struggling to meet their daily needs. It's increasingly difficult to find clean food, uh, clean water, 
and access to basic health care. Israel says it's facilitated over 260 aid trucks into Gaza. This UN truck full of supplies makes its way to the north, days after 118 people were killed during an aid delivery. Israel is facing accusations soldiers fired on civilians last Thursday, but its army insists many of the dead were trampled and soldiers had fired warning shots. We have all the documentation that we need in order to carry out an exhaustive, truthful investigation into the facts, and we will present our findings. It was a humanitarian operation we were running, and the claim that we deliberately attacked the convoy and deliberately harmed people is completely baseless. Israel says three soldiers were killed and 14 injured when the troops inadvertently triggered explosives in a booby-trapped building in the southern city of Khan Yunus. For these infants, it's not just a lack of food they've been born into. Frequent power outages hit the Kamal Adwan Hospital. The UN, quoting Gaza's health ministry, says 10 children have now died from malnutrition and dehydration. Here, staff admit they can do little for the babies. Rashida Yousafzai, SBS World News. US Republican frontrunner Donald Trump has further bolstered his stride to his party's nomination for president. He's trounced his rival Nikki Haley once again in three more states. The wins in Michigan, Missouri and Idaho come just three days before Super Tuesday, the biggest day of the primaries involving 16 states and territories. In Greensboro, North Carolina, Donald Trump's name was on the flags, immigration on the minds of his supporters. My house is two miles from the border. And it's just uh, people are just coming across. You know, there's no vetting, so we don't know who these people are. This is a battleground state, among the most important of the 16 contests on Super Tuesday. Mr. Trump attacking President Joe Biden on the migrant issue, echoing a racist conspiracy theory that Democrats support illegal immigration as a way to weaken the power of white voters. Biden's conduct on our border is by any definition a conspiracy to overthrow the United States of America. As to his fellow contender Nikki Haley, whom he's bested in every primary, he made clear she's no longer a threat. I haven't heard about her in about a week. Has anybody know? She was going around every show, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, this and that. The longer Ms Haley remains in the race, the more chance to highlight Mr Trump's problems with key constituencies in the party. She did well with moderates and independents in some contests. Now saying most Americans don't want either a Trump or a Biden as the nation's leader. The majority of Americans think that we're better than this, think we can do better than this, that we deserve to know what normal feels like. First Lady Jill Biden was in Arizona, blasting Republican efforts to restrict abortion. He's considering a national abortion ban. Donald Trump is dangerous to women and to our families. We simply cannot let him win. Suburban women were one key to the Democrats taking the White House in 2020. But now they, as well as black and Latino voters, are among those worried about Joe Biden's age and his handling of the economy. In the latest New York Times Siena College poll, registered voters were asked if the presidential election were held today, whom would you choose, Biden or Trump? The answer, 48% Donald Trump, 43% Joe Biden. Raina Sarampayat, SBS World News. Well, back home and Labor and the Coalition are dissecting their strategies from yesterday's Dunkley by-election. Labor retained the outer Melbourne seat. Its candidate, Jody Ballier, will fill the vacancy left after the death of Peter Murphy. Our chief political correspondent, Anna Henderson, joins us with analysis from Melbourne tonight. Good evening, Anna. Now, there was a swing against Labor, but what impact is that likely to have? 
Well, Janice, really, this was sort of a mid-cycle temperature check for the major parties about whether their messages are resonating. And Labor certainly sees this result in the seat of Dunkley as an endorsement of its decision to break an election promise and expand out those stage three tax cuts. There were jitters within the Labor Party, fears that there was going to be potentially a loss here. They are not founded in what we've seen in the figures. Let's get a take from the two major federal parties as to what they believe this result represents? I think Jody Bellier ran a very positive campaign. We spoke about cost of living and what we were doing. We spoke about strengthening Medicare. We spoke about fee-free take. It was a, a very good result for the Liberal Party. Uh, we've seen a, a swing of about 3.75%. So this was uh, a very good win. We had a great local candidate. So the Liberal Party was hoping to see a bigger swing, certainly, and there will be questions now about really how the last week in Parliament unfolded, whether or not the coalition was right in opposition to really focus on the cases of those indefinite detainees and border security, whether there was enough discussion of cost of living issues. Janice, the other big matter that was raised last week in federal politics related to that revelation from the ASIO boss Mike Burgess around uh, the suggestion that there was a former politician who was engaged in international espionage. SBS has sat down with the Director General of ASIO where he's revealed a little bit more, certainly not the name, but a little bit more about who this person was and when they were recruited. Media savvy and working the angles to bring secretive missions into public focus. Australia's spy boss sparked a national game of guess who after revealing an explosive case of foreign interference involving a former politician. He's defended his decision to withhold their name in an interview with SBS. If I shared the details of who it was, they might figure out how I worked out who it was or how my organisation, and that's our secret source and I need to protect that. Can you understand why former politicians in particular but others are saying that it is in the public interest for Australians to know who this person is? So I understand the interest. I can understand a view that it's in the public interest, but I don't agree with that. I think the public interest and the reason why I do my threat assessment speeches is to raise awareness of what threats to security look like. It's important those threats are explained to the people we protect. It's important that actually people recognise so they can resist and report such overtures from foreign intelligence services. That was my objective. Won't go further than that. In terms of this former politician, were they recruited or did some of this concerning activity happen while they were in Parliament? It, the activity, well, so former politician now, the matter is resolved, but this happened when they were a politician. It happened when they were in a parliament in Australia? Correct. And was it the federal parliament? I won't comment on uh, which parliament it was. Former Liberal Treasurer and previous US Ambassador Joe Hockey has warned the anonymous approach serves to smear all former politicians and could affect trust with international allies. I've noted Mr Hockey's comments. He's entitled to his opinion. I don't agree with him. I've said before many times, I've repeated this many times, the vast majority of politicians are thoroughly resistant to this type of foreign interference. That means there's only a very small number who are not. I don't think I've smeared anyone. Delivering a warning to politicians thinking about using parliamentary privilege to air a name. I don't think it would be helpful to disclose anyone and let me explain that. Uh, foreign interference against the political system, targeting local, state and federal, and all parties equally. If you wanted me to get into a name game and name and shame, it would reflect across the entire political spectrum. So if anyone's looking for a political point score by naming one individual, I'd encourage them to think carefully about what they're asking for. The decision to hold back getting the Prime Ministerial nod. Did Mike Burgess make a mistake by raising this case and how can their identity continue to be hidden? Mike Burgess is the Director General of ASIO. That's an important role in our national security and he has uh, my full support. And uh, it was, he makes decisions based upon his national security assessments. 
While the spy agency won't reveal which country conducted the espionage, analysts are confident it was run out of Beijing. The case predates the 2018 federal foreign interference laws, so the politician didn't break the law. ASIO says they no longer pose a risk. And Anna, the Prime Minister, is hosting a special summit in Melbourne with the ASEAN leaders. What will the central focus be? Well, this is a busy time for the Prime Minister, Jana, straight out of the Dunkley by-election and straight into world leaders arriving here in Melbourne. That's leaders from Southeast Asian nations who will be in Melbourne for three days of meetings. There'll be talks on trade, uh, certainly in terms of the, uh, really, the security situation in the region, as well as other issues. We have seen some protests here in Melbourne over the past couple of days. Today, there were some pro-government efforts, and yesterday we saw some pro-democracy uh, and, and pro-human rights groups coming to the streets of Melbourne. So expect there to be issues on the surface and certainly underneath when those bilateral talks get underway between Australia and the different Southeast Asian nations. Timor-Leste and New Zealand also attending here. There will be a, a joint statement at the end of this process and I'm told it won't be necessarily an easy task to hammer out that final agreement between these nations. Certainly China's influence in the region is a big factor that will be in, under consideration as these talks continue. Janice? A big week ahead in Melbourne. Thanks so much. That's our chief political correspondent, Anna Henderson, with analysis from Melbourne. Well, still to come, our special report on a looming global baby bust. Also, the two contenders vying to become Mexico's first female president launch their campaigns. Alarm over a leaked German conversation about giving missiles to Ukraine. And later, blizzards in California and fires in Texas. Dangerous weather conditions threaten millions of people. Global fertility rates have been in sharp decline, almost halving in the past 50 years, from 4.2 children per woman to 2.3. In Australia, it's around 1.6. That's well below the level needed to keep the population constant. And even in regions like Africa, where birth rates are high, they're still trending down. And just this week, South Korea broke its own record for the lowest rate globally. In the first of our special series on the future of fertility, we'll take a look at the planet's looming baby bust. But there are still some families going against the trend. <laughs> With 10 kids, one on the way, plus mum and dad, the Soliolas aren't just a family of talented singers. They'll soon have enough people to field their own footy team. We named our younger twins uh, Alpha and Omega because we thought Omega's going to be the very it. last one and then all of a sudden... Yeah. yeah we, but, uh, Omega number two. No, <laughs> For them, a big family is a blessing. Always having company. Like, I'm never bored. We play with each other at the backyard. You can go have so many friends you want, but... They're the only real ones you're going to have. But it has its challenges. Getting around requires a minibus. The couple have three jobs between them and it takes two hours just to buy groceries. People always, always ask us, like, how do you do it? How do you do it? And even sometimes we're like, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know yeah. how we do it. And financially, it is quite hard. It is hard. It is hard. It's challenging. <laughs> In our rapidly changing world, big families like theirs are increasingly rare. The decline in fertility rates is a really sort of complex issue and um, you can't really look at it through the lens of any single discipline. New research by HSBC estimates based on current trends, the global population could begin declining by 2040 and halve before the end of the century. This turning point well ahead of the 2022 base population forecasts by the UN. Birth rates have fallen to levels that I don't think anyone thought was possible five or ten years ago. Key factors include female education and participation in the workforce, while changing attitudes since the pandemic have accelerated the trend. But the biggest one for me is the cost. Unless you're lucky enough to win a lottery or to inherit loads of money from your parents, you are not buying a house at the very earliest until you're in your 30s. And for a lot of people, you don't want to start a family until you've got that security. Nowhere is this more evident than in South Korea, where the youth are referred to as the Sampo generation. 
the generation who've given up on three things, love, marriage and a family. 아무래도 결혼 정년기 청년들이 결혼이나 출산보다 먼저 걱정해야 할 것들이 너무나도 많다는 것인데요. 자녀를 낳고 싶은데 어, 현실적으로 좀 어려울 것 같아요. This delay in having children is critical. The World Health Organization says around one in six people globally will experience infertility. Women lose their fertility rapidly over a five or six year period. For men, it's slower, but there's still a significant decline with age. Unfortunately, we cannot um, change our biology to meet our social aspirations. We rather have to change the way we structure society in order to encourage young couples to have children earlier in life. Sperm counts are also declining by about 2% per year, due in part to environmental toxins and lifestyle factors. If it keeps on happening, then you will get to a point where you do literally run out of spermatozoa and it starts to have an impact on fertility. In Australia, one in 18 children are now born through IVF. Its technology experts say is essential. <laughs> Even in places like sub-Saharan Africa, where fertility rates are high, but access to medical infertility care remains scarce. In countries where having children is uh, a woman's main uh, role in life, uh, not having any is, is a deeply uh, confronting and, and difficult situation for women. As countries become more prosperous, research shows fertility rates decline, which will have economic consequences going forward. Do you raise retirement ages? Do you raise taxes considerably? Do you make health care worse or pensions worse? But having children is also a matter of personal fulfilment. I don't think fertility is ever a question of good or bad, but it is a question of choice or should be a question of choice. And the Soliolas wouldn't have things any other way. Stay encouraged. If you, if you want a big family, you can have a big family. Sarah Conti, SBS World News. And that story was done in collaboration with the Australian Science Media Centre and supported by a Meta Public Interest Journalism Fund administered by the Walkley Foundation. Assistance was also provided by SBS Korean. Chad's military leader, Mahamat Idris Deby, says he'll run in the country's presidential elections in May. Just days ago, his main opponent was killed in suspicious circumstances. On Friday, the government confirmed that Deby's uncle had been arrested following the incident. As Deby announced his candidacy, he made no reference to the killing. The vote will mark the end of three years of military rule in the country. Meanwhile, the two candidates vying for Mexico's presidency have launched their campaigns. One of them will become the country's first female to hold the office. It marks a shift for a nation that's long held a macho culture. It was a statement of intent. Claudia Scheinbaum filled Mexico City's central plaza, the heart of the country, to launch a presidential campaign. About 200,000 people showed up. She's the front runner for the presidency, in large part because she's the chosen heir of the current popular incumbent, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. And she's not afraid to play on that. Shout so that the president can hear. It's an honor to follow Obrador. The former mayor of Mexico City, an environmental engineer, pledged to continue her predecessor's work. Are we going to let the privileged and corrupt return? That's why we're going to keep fighting for the transformation of Mexico. Her opponent, the opposition candidate Xochitl Galvez, opted to start her own campaign with a midnight walk through Fresnillo, the town in Mexico where most residents fear for their safety. 96% of the people in this city feel insecure and no wonder. There are massacres, femicides, missing people, murders of civilians and police officers. Here in Fresnillo, as in all of Mexico, people are afraid. She's trying to attack the Achilles heel of Scheinbaum and Lopez Obrador's ruling party, Morena, that it hasn't been able to stop Mexico's endemic violence. Plain spoken with indigenous roots and a mischievous side that once saw her parade through the country's Senate in a T-Rex costume to protest outdated policies, Galvez has the popular touch.
but she's facing an uphill battle. The polls show Scheinbaum with more than double her projected votes. Whatever happens when Mexico goes to the urns this June, this election is going to be historic. And that's because whoever wins, Mexico is going to have its first woman president. And for a country that struggles with femicides, with glass ceilings for women, with machismo, that's huge. Now come three months of gruelling campaigning for Xochitl Galvez to try and break what looks like an unshakable lead for Scheinbaum. John Holman reporting there from Mexico City. Germany says it's urgently investigating the authenticity of an audio recording reported to be a German defence discussion on Ukraine. The conversation was revealed by Russian state media. It sparked fears that Berlin is the victim of high-level spycraft by Moscow. The possibility of espionage setting off alarm bells. It's a very serious Angelegenheit and deshalb wird das jetzt sehr sorgfältig, sehr intensiv und sehr zügig aufgeklärt. Das ist auch notwendig. The German Chancellor referring to a 38-minute audio recording published in Russian state media, said to be a conference call between high-ranking German military officials speaking about supplying weapons for Ukraine and, according to Russia, a planned attack on the Crimean bridge. Berlin now urgently seeking clarification from the Kremlin. Russia says it was blatant self-exposure that revealed the, quote, cunning plans of the German armed forces. Residents were forced to evacuate their homes in St. Petersburg after a drone struck an apartment block. There were no casualties. But in the southern Ukrainian city of Odessa, local officials say at least eight people, including two children, were killed when a Russian drone destroyed a residential building. As emergency rescue teams scoured the rubble for signs of life, the Ukrainian president said the deadly attack could have been avoided. Volodymyr Zelensky called on Western allies to step up, adding that Ukraine has asked for nothing more than what is necessary to protect lives. Over the past two months, several Western leaders have signed lengthy security agreements with Kyiv. Ukraine struggling with arms shortages as a crucial package of U.S. military assistance remains stuck in Congress. Recent Ukrainian setbacks allowing Russian troops to make gains. Rochelle Harrison-Pless, SBS World News. A man has been arrested following a five-hour standoff in Geelong. Emergency services responded to reports of a possible firearms incident. Officers found the man barricaded inside a property. A woman was allegedly inside with him for several hours before she was able to leave uninjured. Both individuals are now assisting police with their inquiries. Officers say despite early reports, there's nothing to suggest the firearms incident had occurred. Many Mardi Gras revelers have been recovering from a long 24 hours of celebrations. The parade has been overshadowed by tragedy and also marred by controversy. But even a mid-parade protest didn't halt the festivities. For decades, Dykes on Bikes have been the high-octane Mardi Gras opener. But this year, the chorus of engines fell silent. Such is the weight of shock and sadness for the deaths of Jesse Baird and Luke Davies. Tributes to the couple scattered throughout the parade of more than 200 floats. The Sydney Swans with black armbands to honour Jesse, an experienced AFL umpire. The Qantas Gay 380, emblazoned with Luke's name, a well-loved crew member. Luke would have wanted his life to be celebrated tonight. I think that's why everybody's so happy to be here. We have Mark Luke, Mark walking with us tonight. And that is just a special moment to share with her. With a police officer charged over the couple's alleged murder, the long-running involvement of the force polarising. 
This year, officers were out of formal uniform, but with an armed escort. Well, it's a compromise that we're here, but we are here, and I think it's um, great that it's a good display of inclusion that we're part of this. Uniformed police remained for crowd control, unable to stop a group of pro-Palestinian activists jumping the fence, blocking the way with flares. Swiftly apprehended and dragged off the road, eight facing charges. Disruption just metres away from Chris Minns, the first sitting New South Wales Premier to march. Look, I had a great night. It didn't really affect me too much. In fact, with the coloured flares and the, and the banner, I thought it was part of Mardi Gras. With scattered showers, some traded speedos for ponchos. The weather doing little to dampen spirits. A euphoric atmosphere for everyone, from the first timers to those who were there from the start. Uh, it's pretty fun, it's a pretty amazing experience, new experience for us to support the LGBT community. Amazing, nothing but positive and it's been such a good time. It's been a challenging fortnight for Sydney's LGBTIQ plus community, but tonight a perfect example of how to rally together. A show of solidarity with a shimmy and a sachet to show they won't be defeated by tragedy. That is, after all, the spirit in which this tradition first started more than four decades ago. Naveen Razik, SBS World News. The west coast of the United States is facing another gruelling night of extreme blizzard conditions. Major highways are closed and visibility down to zero. But it's not the only extreme weather being faced in the US. A chilly blanket of disruption and destruction. Oh, hectic. It, the snow is wet underneath and uh, there's about a foot of fresh snow in Truckee here. And uh, it's been hectic. I've broken a lot of parts. US meteorologists saying a cold front from Alaska and a low pressure system have combined to create blizzard conditions. The perfect storm dumping up to three and a half metres of snow in California and blowing winds of more than 230 kilometres an hour, leaving mountain communities stranded. The tornado warnings uh, in parts of California issued, funnel clouds reported, so we'll be watching for that over the next several hours and the heavier snow is going to continue. The conditions so extreme, the main highway between California and Nevada has been closed for 24 hours and will remain closed until further notice. Some of that heavier snow is now getting down into the foothill locations and that's where a lot more people live than the higher mountains. Meanwhile, Texas is experiencing extremes of a different kind. The largest wildfire ever recorded in the state, which has spread over 4,000 square kilometres, killing two people. When you look at the damages that have occurred here, it's just gone. Completely gone. Nothing left but ashes on the ground. It's estimated two million people are at risk from the fire which has spread into neighbouring Oklahoma. Early assessments show that hundreds of structures, largely in farming areas, have been destroyed, with gusty winds forecast to fuel the huge blaze over the coming days. Diana Damjanovic, SBS World News. Brazil's president, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, says he's working hard to maintain South America as a zone of peace. Negotiations are ongoing between Guyana and Venezuela over a territorial dispute of the oil-rich border area of Essequibo. Brazil has emerged as a mediator in the centuries-old debate, but President Lula says he doesn't expect a quick solution. Of Barbados. The elephant in the room at the annual summit of leaders of Caribbean nations, or CARICOM, was the increasingly tense territorial dispute between host country Guyana and its South American neighbor Venezuela. The two countries have been in a border dispute since the 1800s, with Venezuela claiming the land west of the Essequibo River, equivalent to two-thirds of what Guyana considers its territory. 
While not a member of CARICOM, the president of Brazil, Lula da Silva, weighed in on the way to St. Vincent. The issue can't be ignored because it's almost centuries old. We've been dealing with it for years, through the courts and the UN, and this will continue. What we're going to do is work to ensure that it continues to be discussed and debated and that we can find a solution as friendly as possible. Brazil is one of the mediators in current negotiations between the disputing countries. Venezuela does not recognize the International Court of Justice's jurisdiction and is building up military forces along the border with Guyana. No se metan con Venezuela. President Nicolás Maduro accuses Guyana of carrying out a, quote, brutal dispossession of Venezuela's sovereign territory. But the principal reason for the renewed push to take over the Essequibo region is the discovery of large oil deposits there. Of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. Guyana is also appealing for Washington's support. We need to advance this conversation, how we mobilize investment in security in this region to ensure that you are also secure. Our United States uh, friends and cabinet members are here. I think this requires serious and immediate attention. President Lula is betting on current negotiations. Brazil's strategy is to work not only for development, but to work intensively to keep South America as a zone of peace on Earth. It may not be easy. At stake, among other things, is the ownership of an estimated 11 billion barrels of oil and natural gas. Lucia Newman reporting there. Well, coming up, tributes for the fashion icon who called herself the geriatric starlet. And claims of a racial slur hit the NRL season opener in Las Vegas. Fashion model Iris Apfel is being remembered for being extraordinary and an icon. The American businesswoman has died at the age of 102. Known for her quirky style and signature round glasses, she originally specialised in interior design before signing a modelling contract in her 90s. You're not pretty and you'll never be pretty, but it doesn't matter. You have something much better. You have style. They are the words that came to define Iris Apfel, who described herself as a geriatric starlet. She became a global phenomenon at the age of 87 when her extraordinary collection of clothes and accessories were exhibited in New York. She signed a modelling contract when she was 97. I think dressing up should be fun. I think too many women in America, anyhow, I don't know how it is here, just get themselves into such a snit about what to wear and what not to wear that... I often say it's better to be happy than well-dressed. Apfel made her name as an interior designer, working on projects for nine different American presidents at the White House with her husband, Carl. We're not supposed to talk about the White House. They get very upset. Well, we had a problem with Jack. Stop. <laughs> Listening to Apfel was as beguiling as watching her. She was a cross between Anna Winter and Joan Rivers. In the words of my grandpa, a woman is as old as she looks, but a man is never old until he stops looking. <laughs> Apfel would scour flea markets for accessories, her more is more approach based on what she loved rather than price. I get more kick out of this. It cost four dollars and change and if my husband took me to Harry Winston. She had more than three million followers on social media, inspired by her honesty, creativity and razor-sharp wit. Fellow designer Tommy Hilfiger said she was an incredible talent with a huge heart and a magic touch. The huge glasses were Iris Apfel's trademark. She even had her own doppelganger in the cartoon The Incredibles. People would say, why do you wear them so large? And I would say, the bigger to see you. And I would shut them up. More is more. Graham Satchel reporting there and looking back on the life of Iris Apfel.
Well, time now for the day in sport with Brianna Holden. And Bri, Australia's cricketers have secured another trophy. And one over our nearest rivals, Janice, with Australian cricket fans today celebrating as the team retained the Trans-Tasman Trophy. Nathan Lyon spun his side to a 172-run win before lunch against New Zealand in Wellington. Lyon took six wickets as the long wait for a home test victory continues for the Black Caps. The last time New Zealand achieved that feat was back in 1993. Beginning day four needing 258 more runs for an unlikely victory, it was a change in wind direction that ended New Zealand's hopes. A southerly breeze saw Nathan Lyon change ends and then he blew a hole through the top order. First to fall was the dangerous youngster Rachin Ravindra. Out, out. You just felt like it was going to happen. In Lyon's next seven deliveries, he removed Tom Blundell. Oh, no. Oh, no. And then Glenn Phillips. And on the pads and gone. Absolutely no hesitation from Maria Rasmus. Six down soon became seven, with first inning centurion Cameron Green getting in on the wicket-taking action. It's going to be out. Nice piece of bowling from Cam Green. It's taken off. Tim Southey was Lyons' 10th wicket for the match, and that's the fifth time he's hit double figures in a test. That one will not go far enough. Josh Hazelwood completed the win with a caught and bowled. It's gone straight up in the air, and Hazelwood accepts the chance. And that's that in the first test. And Australia have won it quite convincingly in the end. As much bounce as I've seen on any wicket for a long time. Um, and then, yeah, thought, well, thankfully spun, um, which with Nathan in our side, it's always a pretty good thing. Yeah, we'll reflect on this, we'll um, debrief it and uh, obviously move to a ground, um, a different ground, different surface, a ground that we've had a lot of success at. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll prepare uh, obviously in Christchurch, but we have a couple of days here to, to reflect on this week. The second and final test gets underway on Friday. A crowd of over 40,000 has attended the NRL season opening doubleheader in Las Vegas. The matches were the first instalment in a five-year plan for rugby league to earn a slice of the US sports market and have been described as a pivotal moment for the sport. Few other cities on earth deal with smoke and mirrors more effectively than Las Vegas. Veteran broadcasters enjoying the NRL season opening extravaganza. I've covered 37 seasons of this great sport. This is, without question, the biggest event that I've ever had the privilege of being a part of. While fans at home also got into the party atmosphere, usually reserved for grand finals. But the cost of the five-year plan has faced scrutiny. Just been an enormous cost blowout, but overall, when you look back at it, this will be one of those pivotal moments in the game's history where everybody will remember, whether they're here or not, they'll remember the Vegas expedition. Frank Sinatra famously sang I Did It My Way and the NRL's own chairman of the board says the experiment is as much about the game off the field as what happens on it. There's a market here uh, for sports betting as well uh, and this is all about trying to raise revenue for the game so we can put it back into the juniors, participation and the clubs. You know, if we succeed here, the whole game, the whole ecosystem uh, succeeds. The first match offering couldn't be faulted for entertainment value. The Manly Sea Eagles and South Sydney Rabbitohs put on an 11-try blockbuster with the lead changing hands several times. South's biggest star Latrell Mitchell put his side back in front early in the second, but it didn't last. Manly's Trebojevic brothers linked up when Tom put Ben into score and retake the lead. And new signing Luke Brooks iced the win with a late try as Manly ran out 12-point winners. A magical debut. The meeting between the Brisbane Broncos and the Sydney Roosters was a much tighter affair. The Roosters took the honours in a 20-10 win, but there was an alleged racial slur against Ezra Mam, who complained to the officials that he'd been targeted by Rooster Spencer Lenu. OK, Ezra's made a formal complaint that's racial in nature, OK, against Spencer. If there is a hangover from the season openers, the NRL officials will be hoping it's about action on the field and not an alleged racial slur. John Baldock, SBS World News. 
Liverpool is four points clear at the top of the Premier League table after a dramatic late win over Nottingham Forest. Reds forward Darwin Nunez nodded home the winner in the 98th minute of the match. That sparked wild scenes on and off the pitch, with Forest protesting a controversial decision in the lead-up to the goal, which saw the home side denied possession. Coach Nuno Espirito Santo refusing to take part in the discussion. First of all, the referee's decision when you're in a very good attacking point. Let's speak about other things, come on. We had chances, clear ones. It's been happening for a while with us. We, we play good, we, uh, we combine, we have chances and we are being punished in the end. So. Meanwhile, Tottenham clawed back three points to win 3-1 against Crystal Palace and remain in the league's top five. Timo Werner finally ended his duck for Spurs to spark the late turnaround. In Spain, England midfielder Jude Bellingham was the centre of a bust-up in Real Madrid's draw with Valencia. The referee blew for full time as a cross was delivered to Bellingham for what he thought was the winner. As a result, he was sent off after the final whistle for protesting the referee's decision to call full time. Sydney FC has emphatically claimed its 16th derby victory over Western Sydney. The away side were off the mark early thanks to a Ryan Grant header. By the time that was doubled from the spot four minutes later, the match was all but won for Sydney. The Sky Blues eventually leaving with a 4-1 win. In Formula, One's Red Bull, in Formula One, Red Bull's Max Verstappen has started the season right where he left off with a resounding victory in the Bahrain Grand Prix. The reigning champion led home a Red Bull 1-2. Despite the result, though, team principal Christian Horner remains embroiled in a row surrounding his alleged inappropriate behaviour. If there's one person keen to get a grip on the narrative, it's Christian Horner. Having spent weeks denying allegations of inappropriate behaviour, he arrived for the first race flanked by his wife and former Spice Girl, Jerry Horner. A display of unity in the desert amid the drama. It's lights out and away we go. Who better to defuse the heat surrounding Red Bull than the cool-headed Max Verstappen? A slick start kept the world champion in front, and his rivals were soon nowhere to be seen. Hopes for Lewis Hamilton soon fell flat, courtesy of a battery issue, and then this. Grabbing the bull by the horns, Verstappen made it into a procession. His teammate Sergio Perez, the nearest challenger, some 20 seconds behind. He wins the Bahrain Grand Prix. Picking up where he left off last year, Verstappen was focused, he was fast, he was first. A 1-2 for the team, much to Horner's delight. Brilliant, brilliant start to the year. Thank you very, very much. Red Bull starting the season with a bang. It's very enjoyable. You know, these kind of days, they don't happen that often where everything just seems to be perfect. The car just feels spot on. You know, you don't really have any big complaints. So that was very enjoyable. Standing by Christian Horner here is the team's majority owner from Thailand, who could be crucial in determining if he remains at the helm. Success is significant for Horner's future, but so is support. Laura Scott with that report. And finally, in sport, Alex Dermanor has defended his Acapulco title with a dominant win over Casper Ruud. The world number nine used his clinical first serve to full effect against the Norwegian to win the match in straight sets 6-3, 6-3. The result solidifies his spot in the men's top ten and marks his eighth ATP Tour title. And that's the day in sport. And Janice, it looks like Alex Dermanor is set for a big 2024. And let's hope so. Thanks so much, Bree. Well, coming up, the weather details and a celebration of education for a community in Australia which considers it a privilege. Time to check the weather forecast now and showers and storms should scatter in humid and unstable air across much of Western Australia, the Northern Territory and far north Queensland. Showers and storms are expected to intensify in northeastern parts of New South Wales and southeast Queensland. To the major centres now, partly cloudy skies in Sydney, Canberra and Melbourne. It'll be overcast in Hobart, Adelaide and Perth. Showers and a possible storm ahead for Darwin, a top of 32 degrees. Showers and wet weather also for Brisbane, heading for a top of 30 degrees. 
Checking conditions further afield now. Thunderstorms ahead for Nandi, showers to hit Port Vila, windy in Auckland and Wellington. To Southeast Asia now, partly cloudy skies in Phnom Penh, thunderstorms in Kuala Lumpur and Singapore, rain ahead for Jakarta and Delhi, thunderstorms in Honiara. Let's see what's happening further north now, cloudy and grey in Beijing, fine weather in Tokyo, drizzle in Shanghai and Hong Kong and partly cloudy in Hanoi. Heading west, a few showers ahead for Beirut and Jerusalem, sunny skies for Baghdad, partly cloudy and grey in Islamabad. To Europe now, partly cloudy skies for Stockholm, fine weather on the way for Moscow, drizzle in Warsaw, a few showers ahead for London, clear skies above Paris, rain in Rome, partly cloudy in Istanbul. To Africa now, partly cloudy across Algiers, Casablanca and Dakar, thunderstorms in Lagos and Nairobi, fine and clear in Johannesburg. To South America now, sunny skies ahead for Caracas, a few showers in Bogota, cloudy in Lima, thunderstorms in Asuncion, overcast in Buenos Aires, sunshine in Santiago. And finally, for North America, a few showers on the way for Vancouver, cloudy in New York, blue skies for Denver and LA, partly cloudy in Havana and Mexico City. Every year, the Hazara community here in Australia come together to acknowledge the academic success of their youth. The awards night celebrates education, something that many in this community consider a privilege. Walking through the grounds of Sydney University, 17-year-old Zaina Brezoi has her eyes set on becoming a doctor a future prospect made possible by her exceptionally high ETA of 99.45. The best bit about that day was telling my parents. Zainab says she was raised in a house where education was encouraged, not enforced, although it didn't take her long to understand the value of it herself. Her father, Mohammed Ibrahim Rezoi, made the dangerous boat journey to Australia in 1999, fleeing the brutality of the Taliban and fearing the fate of the Hazara people who have long faced persecution in Afghanistan. I remember when he kind of told me the story of how he got here. That did serve as a motivation because I knew how both my mum and my dad, they gave up so much for me to be here. Zainab's success took centre stage at this year's Hazara Awards Night, where she was celebrated alongside other high achievers in the community. Seeing the progress of the Hazara community really warms my heart uh, and it's a delight to be part of an event like tonight. For Zainab's father, seeing his daughter excel is bittersweet. <laughs> Organisers of this event are young recent graduates themselves who say community recognition can serve as huge motivation for recipients and future graduates. Every year we have a bigger and bigger turnout because not only do they want to support the youth, but they also want to witness in them what they themselves, uh, being in Afghanistan, didn't have. I'm a Utah student myself, so seeing more and more people on stage really encourages me to do better. Hopefully, inshallah, I'm on stage next year. It's like one of my biggest motivations to be up there. The event also an opportunity for the community to strengthen their cultural pride and identity. Mahno Zanguri, SBS World News. And before we go, from tomorrow, SBS will have the latest news from New Zealand on SBS Viceland. One News Midday will be broadcast at 10 past 12 and One News at 6 will screen at 5.40 in the afternoon. Stay up to date with the latest from New Zealand tomorrow on SBS Viceland and SBS On Demand. That is The World This Sunday from the World News team. Good night. <laughs>